Hi everybody and welcome back to Connerty Meadows Farm. This is the first video in a video series that we're going to be making about cheese making. The purpose of this video is to go over the utensils and the items that we're using during cheese making so that each video that we make we don't have to repeat this information. You can just look to this video for all the pertinent information. All right, so let's get started. First thing that we will be talking about is the book that we use for all of our cheese making. So this book, um, we get all of our supplies from the same lady that produced this book at Glengarry Cheese and I will put a link to that in the description below. Um, they are a Canadian company and uh, they've been fantastic to work with. This is not a sponsored video. A lot of the information that I'm gonna cover in this video is actually also covered in this book. So the first thing that you're gonna need when you're cheese making is a recipe, which that book is full of, and a pot. Now this pot of ours is very large stock pot. It holds about 12 liters, and most of the recipes that we make are uh, 12 to 15 liters of milk. You, uh, don't need a super expensive pot, just a big pot. Um, and we actually use two pots because for the most part, we retain our whey. We don't just dump it down the sink. We ferment our whey for a chicken feed. You feed it to your pigs, you feed it back to your cows. You can make whey bread. And I do have uh, a bunch of recipes and a link on how to do that that I'll attach as well. So two big pots the same size and then another pot that's a little bit bigger and the purpose for the second bigger pot is to basically create a double boiler so here's the big pot and you'll put this inside this will get filled with water and then the milk is going to go in here and what that's going to do is it's going to help evenly distribute the heat and not be direct heat on this pot. Now, if you can't get your hands on a really big pot like this, which we got from a restaurant supply store, you can also use a water bath canner. So here's my big water bath canner. And my pot will fit inside the water bath canner as well. And you can see there's room all the way around. So you don't have to invest in a special pot you can also use what you have on hand. And along with our double boiler and our big pot, so we're gonna need a colander. And you want a colander that's gonna fit nicely inside your pot. And this is for when you pour the whey off. You're also going to need some cheesecloth. Now there's this traditional cheesecloth, but we also use this plasticky kind of cheesecloth. And we've actually found that this cheesecloth works a lot better for uh, cheeses like uh, Parmesan, Monterey Jack, Havarti. So you can use either. We just found that with the cloth one, a lot of times when we were peeling it off, uh, chunks of cheese would be stuck on it. So we mainly use this kind of cloth for our cheddar and these ones for all of our other hard ones. So along with your cheesecloth, you're going to need something to hold the cheesecloth into the colander. And we use stainless steel clothespins. And that'll just hold it as we pour the whey and the curds into here. We've covered our pots and our cheesecloth, and now let's move on to our stirring utensils. So this slotted spoon is what we use to stir the milk in the beginning stages of making the cheese. When we add the rennet, when we add the culture, when we add the calcium chloride. If you have a slotted spoon, that's perfectly fine. You don't need to buy a fancy utensil. We've spent a lot of years doing this and collecting and buying these items as we could. This is our cheese cutter. A knife works just fine. And this is what we use to initially cut the cheese. This is actually a fairly recent purchase for us. In past years, we just used a big old whisk. 
Now this whisk is a little bit more heavy duty. We got this at a restaurant supply store because we knew we were going to be using it to um, do a lot of heavy work, so to speak. So I wanna show you the technique here on how we cut the curd using the whisk. Straight down and turn as you come up and you go around the whole outside of the pot and then into the inside. Now the author of the book that we recommend is the one that actually suggested we go ahead and purchase a whisk versus anything else when we first started making cheese because you'll use this tool for multiple purposes. The last thing that you need, and it is an important one, is a thermometer. Um, you can just get your standard, put it in the pot thermometer. We have a digital one. I really like this one. It's actually the same one I use for making chocolates and for making our maple syrup. So it's a very multi-purpose uh, thermometer. I just like the digital aspect. It's really easy to quickly look and see what the temperature is. This temperature varies from cheese to cheese. So having a good thermometer is very important. The other things that you're going to need, you're going to need a coagulant and run it. So ours is animal rennet. I do know that there's vegetable ones out there. Uh, I can't tell you how well they work or anything about them because we use animal rennet. There are two types of animal rennet. There is liquid animal rennet, which is exactly what this one is. There's also rennet tablets that you can use um, instead of liquid rennet. Now rennet needs to be kept in a cool location, so your fridge. And then we have calcium chloride. Now, if you're using raw milk, calcium chloride is not a necessary ingredient. What it does do though, is it maintains the same flavor of your cheeses throughout the season. So in our case, our cow, she lives out on pasture in the summer. We're in Canada, so she lives out in pasture in the summer. And in the winter time, she's confined to a little bit smaller of an area and she's fed hay. So her milk is going to change depending on what she's eating from grass to hay. And what the calcium chloride does for us is it maintains that taste throughout the seasons. You have to use calcium chloride if your milk is pasteurized. So if you're buying your milk from a store, you have to use calcium chloride. Otherwise it won't work properly. Both your calcium chloride and your rennet are mixed in water when you add it to your milk, but you need to use non-chlorinated water. We live in the country and we have a well, so our water is naturally non-chlorinated. So it's safe for us to use water from our tap. You may need to use water from a different source. And the last thing you need is your cultures. Depending on the cheese is gonna depend on what kind of culture you're using. And all of that, is covered in this book in the recipes. So the cultures are usually like a fine dried powder you sprinkle on the top of the milk and you'll see that in our subsequent videos how we use it and it has to be kept in the freezer. So what we usually do is we will roll it up and then put it in a plastic bag when we're not using it. So we have a number of different cultures here because we make a number of different kinds of cheeses. This isn't all of them. I just pulled a few out of the freezer for you to see. And of course, you're going to need molds to put your cheese into after you've made it. So for soft cheeses, you can have a basket style mold or these molds that have holes in them. So depending on the kind of soft cheese you're making is going to depend on which mold you're going to be grabbing. The two molds that we use the most is our Gouda mold and we've made a press for that and I'll link the video to that somewhere at the top here. Um, and then the hard press other mold. So for the Gouda, you need mold and ours comes with essentially a cheesecloth insert. You can just buy them like this and then just use your own cheesecloth, but this gives it a more uniform look. And then the follower goes down on top. And then our press, this is our Gouda cheese press. Now we've handmade this 
most people will use a different style of presses, but this has worked quite well for us. And then this just goes down on top. You put your weights on and you still get the perfect weights. So that's for Gouda. When we're using our homemade Gouda press, we do put it on a cookie sheet so that the whey is not running all over the counter. And so this just collects the way. And we have little feet on the bottom that keep the board off of the way. And this is the other mold that we use. Now, in order for us to use this and not have the way go all over the counter, I have a 9 by 13 pan, and yes, there is a cheese in here. I have a little wire rack, and we tilt it up some. And this is what this cheese press looks like. This is the hard cheese press mold that Glengarry has on their website. I'll just show you that. So it actually is two molds. So you your first smaller one with its own lid, and then you have the bigger one with its own lid. And the way this is designed is that this will go on the top, and then you're gonna screw this down and press down on the cheese and then the way is going to come out and that is why we have it elevated with the spoon so that the way drips down you don't want your way settling down on the top of the mold because it's going to start to warp your mold given that the bottom part here is wood so it's important to tilt this one now after you make your cheese you'll need to have a way to age it if you're making a hard cheese. Usually soft cheeses, you're just putting them straight into the fridge. So what we do is we have a rack in our kitchen. Here is the rack in our kitchen, and the bottom shelf is all uh, cheddar, and then this one's Parmesan, Monterey Jack, Gouda or Gouda, and this one over here is Havarti. So after you take them out of the mold, you need to allow them to air dry enough before you're putting them into long-term storage. And enough is so that you can touch them and they're not gonna, your hands are not gonna come off moist at all. So then the next step that we do is we apply a wax coating. And what this does is it will help inhibit mold from growing inside of how we store them. After applying the wax cream cheese coating, which is a mold inhibitor, to each cheese twice over and allowing it to dry in between, we vacuum seal each cheese individually. Once vacuum sealing is complete, each cheese has its name, the date, and what we used in it for the culture and whether or not we use calcium chloride so that we have a record that's easily accessible easy to read and we don't have to go flipping pages to find what is on each cheese. The next step is then aging them in the fridge. Each cheese has to be turned a minimum of three to four times a week and this process means that we're as we're flipping each cheese individually we're also checking it over for any imperfections or maybe mold growing or anything like that. So you're getting a real hands-on time with each of these cheeses. You can hard wax them and put them in a cheese cave as well. Now each cheese is going to require a bit of a different process. Cheddar, you put straight on the shelf and you let it dry out, you put your wax on and you put it in the fridge. You need two coats of wax. For Monterey Jack, uh, Gouda, Havarti, and Parmesan, they need to go in a salt brine. And how to do the salt brine and how to store it is all in the book here. We have our salt brine in our cellar where it's relatively cold and um, once the cheese comes out of the press, it goes straight into that salt brine. We would not be doing you a good service in this video if we didn't talk about sanitization. It is very important that all of your utensils are sanitized. 
I also recommend at the beginning of making a batch of cheese that you take any old tea towels that have been used in your kitchen and dishcloths and put them in the laundry and get out fresh stuff. That way you know that everything that you're making during the cheese making process is clean and fresh. Make sure you're washing your hands a lot and again, sterilize all your equipment before using it. If you don't sterilize and bacteria gets into your cheese, you'll end up throwing out your cheese and then all your effort will be wasted. The other thing that needs to be sterilized is your cheesecloths. Now I am actually very allergic to bleach, so we sterilize our cheesecloths here by bringing them to a boil on the stove with water and vinegar and it will still sterilize them. Then we hang them on the line to dry them. We will be showing you many different cheeses that we're gonna be making, and actually it'll be Thomas making the cheeses. I assist, but he's the cheese maker. Again, any information on making cheese is going to be found in this book. Recipes, step-by-step -step instructions, things to look for, how to make your brines, how to store your cheese. There's many different bits of information that I'm not covering in this video that is covered in this book. I hope that answers some of your questions and thanks for hanging out with us on the farm. We'll see you next time when we're making cheese.